Say you are writing a payment service and you wrote an API that transfers money from one account to another. But because of a network glitch, the client automatically retried the API call and this led to the reduction of money twice. To handle this situation, we need our APIs to be idempotent and in this video, we take a look at what idempotent APIs are, how to write them and how they form the heart and crux of any payment service. But before we move forward, I'd like to talk to you about a course on system design that I've been running for over a year and a half now. The course is a cohort based course, which means I won't be rambling a solution and it will not be a monologue at all. Instead, a small focused group of 50 to 60 engineers will be brainstorming the systems and designing it together. This way, we build a very solid system and learn from each other's experiences. The course is enrolled by 800 plus engineers spanning 12 cohorts and 12 countries. Engineers from companies like Google, Microsoft, GitHub, Slack, Facebook, Tesla, Yelp, Flipkart, Dream11 and many 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 more have taken this course and have some wonderful things to say. The course is focused on building systems the way they are built in the real world. We will be focusing heavily on building the right intuition so that you are ready to build any and every system out there. We will be discussing the trade-offs of every single decision we make just like how you do in your team. We cover topics ranging from real-time text communication for Slack to designing our own toy load balancer to Crickbus's live text commentary to doing impressions counting at scale. In all, we would be covering roughly 28 systems and the detailed curriculum split week by week can be found in the course page linked in the description down below. So, if you are looking to learn system design from the first principles, you will love this course. I have two offerings for you. The first one is the live cohort based course and the second one is the recorded offering. The live cohort based course happens once every two months and will go on for eight weeks while the recorded course contains the recordings from one of the past cohorts as is. If you are in a hurry and want to learn and want to binge learn system design, I would recommend going you for the recorded one. Otherwise, the live cohort is where you can participate and discuss the systems and its design live with me and the entire cohort. The decision is totally up to you. The course details, prerequisites, testimonials can be found on the course page arpitbhani.me slash masterclass. I repeat arpitbhani.me slash masterclass and I would highly recommend you to check that out. I have also put the link of this course page in the description down below and I am looking forward to see you in my next cohort. Say user A makes an API call to the backend and there was some issue with the network because of which the call failed. In this situation, we can do one of these three things. First, we can ignore the error and move forward, the easiest of all. The second, we can pass the observed error to the user and then let user decide if he or she would want to retry or do whatever with it. And third, we can do an automatic retry on our own. Typically, you would think that, hey, automatic retries gives the best user experience, so let's just do that. But depending on where the failure happened, it would determine if we could retry or not. Let me give you a few examples. So let's say we look at the failure timeline on where possibly the failure could have happened. First, let's say user A makes an API call, but before this call even hit the server, the, the network got interrupted, which means the request did not even hit the server. If in case you know this, you can automatically re retry. It's basically safe to retry it, given that you know that the request didn't even hit the server. Second situation is when the request hit the server, the server started processing it, but before the process could even complete, the network got terminated or basically uh, there was a network hiccup. In this case, you are not sure if you should retry or not because you don't know what server or at which stage of the server, like while server was processing, at which stage did the network become unreliable. Now, if you retry, you don't know what kind of implications would it have. Right? Third case, which is uh, where the request went to the server, server did its entire computation, entire processing, and while it was about to send the response, before the response could hit the client, the response or the, or the network became unreliable or the network crashed. In this case, again, your client doesn't know that the processing was done, although your server did the processing. Now, in this case, Again, you are not sure if you should retry or not, right? So given the three possible places where or three possible time when the error could have occurred, you would want to either retry or not retry. So which means retrying or automatic retrying is subjective. Now, how do you handle this? So if I take an example, like what could happen? Why, why are we talking about this? What could happen if we just do a normal retry? Right? 
Now, if we just by default always do an automatic retry, there is a chance where some critical endpoints might lead to an unintended behavior. First, for example, let's say with payment service where you have an API that transfers money from A to B's account. Right? And in that case, let's say you have a URL called slash payment slash B, which any authenticated user would hit and in the payload may pass in the amount. Right? So let's say you want to transfer $10,000 to user B. Now in this case, if we just automatically re retry every time we see a failure, what could happen is if let's say we retry n times due to failure that has happened, it is very much possible that we might be deducting n into $10,000 from A and moving it to B. It's totally unintended. Right? So in this case, we cannot just blindly retry until we know or unless we know that server has definitely not processed it. Now here, how do we how do we build a system that is robust enough to handle such situations that either it gives us freedom to do automatic retries or it dictates when to retry and when to not retry. So in either case, the answer to this is we need a way to be idempotent, which means no matter how many times the operation or the request goes, the server will, pro will process the request exactly once. So what we are looking for over here is an exactly once semantic. Now, that is where idempotent API is coming. So the idea here is the APIs that we build needs to be idempotent, which means that when the server sees the API for the first time, it processes it. If it sees the same request being called multiple times, it either ignores or throws error, totally depends on the use case. But what we are exactly trying to do over here is we are trying to build an exactly once semantic that if a request is made, it will be processed exactly once not twice, not thrice, not zero times, but exactly once. Now, this gives us a problem, right? Hey, at least we have now converged to a part where we understand the problem really well. And now we would want to define a solution for this. In order to now here, we can very clearly see that when we are getting so many requests, we need to know that because we would want to process the request exactly once, no matter how many times it comes, we need a way to understand or to keep track or that, hey, have we seen this request before? So you may be tempted to just do a copy paste of URL or rather keep track of all the requests that you have seen. And then you see if, if you have processed it before or not, right? Now here, few challenges with that is that if you just do, if you just keep track of URLs, if you just keep track of URLs, then, and if, the payload is different, then you don't know like what to do or what not to do because you may think that you have already handled it, but you would have not because payload would be different. So then you would, you might be tempted to keep track of the URL and the payload, maybe some parameters you are passing in an HTTP address. So then how do you actually compute? You may be tempted to let me do hash of it and move forward. So instead of making it highly complicated, we keep it really simple, right? And how we go about that is using something called as item potency keys. Instead of doing it implicitly with HTTP URL headers and whatnot, let's just keep it simple and let's just create something called as item potency keys. Now item potency keys is something that would help us or help server disambiguate the request. Now here, how the flow happens. First, your client before making the actual API call first talks to the server to generate a random ID. This random ID will be the item potent key that it would need to pass in future request. Now this key might or it totally depends on the implementation, but against this random ID, your server might store what purpose or what API did the user want to or what operation did the user want to take. For example, money transfer would be one of the operations. You might have other operations for which you are generating the item potent keys. Now this key and the purpose that you and this is something that your server would store in the backend. So that the next time the request comes in, the server keeps or the server can validate if it has handled this request or not. Now here, let's say the first, let's say your client wanted to transfer money from A to B account. So first step it did is it talked to the server to generate a random ID, right? Your server took the operation or uh, generated ID, stored the operation against which this user created something like that meta information. Second, your client then at then invokes the actual API to do the actual money transfer. But while doing that, it passes the random ID that was generated, which is the item potent key. The server then checks the ID that it got in the request and it validates that if it has already handled it or not. 
If it has already handled it, then it ignores or throws the error depending on the implementation. If not, then it handles it and then it updates that, hey, I've already handled this particular key. Now this is where your server is keeping track of a state that if it has already handled this request or not. So then it's responsibility of the server that once it handles it, it either deletes it or marks it as done. Now, it is possible that while this request is being sent or being partially handled, your client sees an error. Your client sees an error because of network glitch that happened. Now, your client would by default retry the request. It would retry the request with the same because now it only has this one, one IDA potent key. And because there was a network glitch, your client, your client retries the same API with the same IDA potent key. If it generates another IDA potent key, which means it is a new request. So when you are retrying, you would be retrying the same API again, which means you would be passing the same item potent key to the backend. Now when server gets this request, it checks that, hey, have I already handled this item potent key or not? If it has already handled it, it would throw the error or ignore the request and tell client to not retry. Or if it has not done it before, then it would just ask and then it would just handle it. Right? This so beautifully solves the problem. So instead of doing an implicit thing on URLs and headers and payloads or hash and compute and whatnot, you keep it really simple and ask your client to tell to ask server for an item potent key and server keeps track of it. Now here, this is exactly what almost all payment service out there does. So Stripe, you go through Stripe's API documentation, you are required to pass an item potency key header while making the API request of transfer. And this is exactly what are this is exactly how most of the payment services are built. They handle item potency this exact same way. And this is exactly how you are that you could pass item potency key. You can also pass in with query parameters and whatnot. But Stripe asks you to pass a request header called item potency key in which this item potency key is passed there. Right. Okay, so a basic flow of architecture is where instead of just having a user and an API server and your payments DB, you would have an auxiliary database, a simple key value store with some TTL in which the idea is that whenever your client would want to make a critical API call, it would first generate an item potency key from the server. The server would generate one, keep track of it in a key value store with some TTL stored. Let's say red is, you may pick any by the way, it really does not matter. So the server keeps track of all of these item potency key in this database that you have with a simple key value store. When the operation is successful, the server actually deletes it from the system. This way, what you get is the server will always ensure that no matter what, the, pro the request is processed exactly once. Right? No matter how many times your client retries, the server would do would process this request exactly once. So what we just built is we built an exactly one semantics for our API. And this is not just limited to payments API. You can apply it to any critical API that needs to be executed exactly once, no matter what. And you can add meta information to handle other cases if you'd want to, or just handle the validation of user and operation and whatnot. But the idea is to have a separate database or a separate table to just keep track of all the item potency keys that the server has ever generated for a user for a particular operation, right? You may have a TTL to reduce space and optimize storage on that part, right? And this is how most payments services or most payments APIs are built by considering item potency. That's really important when you build a critical system like this, right? And all of this is taken from Stripe's engineering blog, which I've linked in the description down below. I would highly recommend you to check out the Stripe's API documentation to understand what all APIs require you to pass item potency keys and what all APIs are just normal, normal, plain, simple APIs that, that basically does not require you to pass such keys. And right? you can very clearly see the difference of which APIs are critical, which APIs are not. And, and yeah, that's it from me for this one. Uh, I hope you found it interesting. I hope you found it amusing. Uh, and yeah, that is it for this one. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a ton.